If your goal is to create a high performing team, um, then you can't let kind of middle performers hang around, right? Uh, because if you do, it just tells your high performers that you're not really serious. So the, the keeper test is a simple mechanism that you or I or any manager can use. They also do something that at Netflix that I think is kind of crazy, but also is quite interesting. Which is Some specific questions that popped into my mind as I was going through the book, I think it was near the very beginning of the book, you had this really interesting framework and I think it was the, the, the keeper test that managers use at Netflix. And I guess this would fall into the talent density uh, okay. bucket of it. But can you go over what that question is? Because I think a lot of yeah. leaders out there, this is an important question for them to ask of their teams. But I also think it's important, it's important if you're not a leader, to get into the mindset of how your leader would answer this question about you. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is quite provocative. It goes along with the adequate performance gets a generous severance. Um, but basically the deal is that if your goal is to create a high performing team, um, then you can't let kind of middle performers hang around. <laughs> right? Uh, because if you do, it just tells your high performers that you're not really serious about, about creating that kind of, that kind of top work environment. And of course you can't give that level of freedom to your, or to your, your employees if yeah. you don't have top people on the team. So the, the keeper test is a simple mechanism that you or I or any manager can use. And that's that you, uh, maybe on every six months or every 12 months as a manager, you ask yourself a question. Do you want to hear something really Really crazy, 96% of the people who watch videos on this channel are not subscribed. Can you do me a favor and help me change that number by subscribing to this YouTube channel? Thank you very much. You imagine that each person on your team is coming to, to meet with you. So here comes Stan, for example, and Stan comes into your office and Stan says, you know, boss, uh, I, I'm sorry, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm leaving the company. Right? I have another job somewhere else. And the question that you ask yourself is, how will you feel hmm. when Stan tells you that he's leaving? Will, will you be devastated? <laughs> will you say, oh my gosh, Stan, don't leave me. <laughs> <laughs> Anything. Will you fight hard to keep Stan? And if you'll fight hard to keep him, that's clear. He's the right person for that team. Yeah. Right? Or maybe would you feel a little bit relieved thinking about the fact that now you could focus your attention on your high performers all the, uh, and stop wasting so much time on one individual? And if so, well, it's really clear that you need to make a tough decision. Yep. So that's the keeper test. You do that about each of your employees. And they also do something that at Netflix that I think is kind of crazy, but also is quite interesting, which is you might do a keeper test prompt which is that you might go to your boss, like if you're my boss, Jacob. And I might say, um, you know, Jacob, I, I just really want to know if I were told you I were leaving the company, would you fight to keep me? Right? Hmm. <laughs> and then you'll know, right? You'll know if you are the best person for that Olympic team or not. Uh, that's a tough question to go ask your leader because if they say no, you're probably going to be... I could see there too, you know, some people would be motivated to be like, oh no, okay, but I, you know, I better try harder. And other people are just going to be like totally crushed and just, oh my God, hanging their head down, I shouldn't be here. And yeah, it's, it, it's a tough question to ask. That's right. And I, I did interview, you know, a lot of employees who did ask those questions. And I can tell you they didn't sleep very well the night before, right? Yeah. Because you're thinking, oh my gosh, what's my boss going to say? Um, but I had one person who said, you know, no matter what the outcome is positive, because if your boss says to you, of course, Jacob, of course, I would fight to keep you. Well, then, you know, you have nothing to be worried about. Yeah. And if your boss says, I think so, but you know, I, I also had a, a couple of doubts and then he tells you those doubts. Well, that's great that you know now, right? Hmm. And if your boss says, you know what, I, I got to tell you, honestly, I, I wouldn't fight to keep you. It's also, I think, really important that we have that information. Well, what can I do to improve then? Or maybe I'm not in the right role. Maybe we can find a better job where it's a better fit, right? So it really encourages, I think, those, those um, courageous conversations that so, so seldomly happen in organizations. How do you keep employees from being burned out in that kind of an environment? Because as we know, I mean, for Olympic athletes, for superstars on, uh, on any particular team, 
you know, eventually they get to a point where, you know, maybe they get injured and they can't play anymore or their performance drops and they get bent. Like keeping up at that kind of level for a long period yeah. of time is, is really, really hard. Um, and I can imagine, yeah, there, you know, probably creates an environment. I don't know. You tell me if this creates an environment where maybe a lot of employees are working 60, 70 hours a week instead of 40. They're not sleeping as much. Maybe you, like I could see a lot of the potential negative impacts that an environment like this mm. would create. Did you see that on Netflix? Yeah. Well, I would say it, it's an intense work culture. I mean, just like being on an Olympic team is intense, yeah. right? Uh, but people, people love their jobs because they're doing work that they choose to do mm. without um, having to get approval from those around them. And we'll come to that later. But I think the other key point here, and this is, I think, the most interesting thing about talent density, is that performance is contagious. So when you have a, a team where all all of the employees are top performers and they're all passing the keeper test. Generally, they're all delighted mm -hmm. to be surrounded by stunning colleagues. Uh, there's actually this, uh, this interesting piece of research that was conducted by a, a colleague of mine at another business school, this guy named Professor William Phelps. Hmm. And what he did was he invited four MBA students into his uh, lab at a time. He gave them a 45-minute task, and he rewarded them financially based on how well they behaved. Now, unbeknownst to them, on 50% of the teams, there was an interloper. And that interloper was this actor named Nick. And, and Nick had been hired to, um, to act just like a regular MBA student, but to do things that were not so great. Like sometimes he would put his feet up on the desk and act kind of bored and text his girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes he would say things that were a little bit jerky, like he might say, hey, have you attended a business school class before, right? And what was so interesting was that Professor Phelps showed, first of all, in study after study after study, that the teams that had Nick on them performed at a 45% worse rate even when wow. the other three uh, MBA students were top of their class. But more interesting than that was that Nick's behavior just seemed to like bleed all over the, the teams and the other people started acting quickly like him. So when he was playing a depressive pessimist, the other people on the team would start to act, act bored or put their heads down on the table. And when he was playing a jerk, it's, it's not just that people would start being jerky back to him, but they'd also start being jerky to one another. So I think that's quite interesting when you ask the question, you know. like, you know, and it is a, a question that we should all ask, like, do I want to work in an environment that's like, a, that's like an Olympic team, right? Okay, well, it's going to be tiring. I'm going to have to work hard and it's going to be intense, right? So a lot of us are going to say, no, thanks. I think I'll, I'll do some work in the garden every morning, please. <laughs> right? um, but then, you know, you have the, the, uh, the, the, fact that you are surrounded by these stunning colleagues and you don't have those people kind of pulling you down, uh, which we've seen happens because performance is contagious. Yeah. Even in, uh, in my book that I wrote uh, called The Future Leader, I was doing some research on just like a toxic, a toxic leader. And it was similar, similar impacts, right? I mean, if you have a toxic leader, their toxicity, their behaviors bleed into other team members. And similarly, if you have a leader who's very positive and optimistic and treats people well and is engaging and motivating, that too spreads. So you can basically think about it like either a good virus or a bad virus. And which one do you want to have inside of your organization? So I love, um, yeah, so I, I think it's very, very consistent um, for that study and also the same things that I found as well. That's right. I think people often think, you know, an individual performance problem is an individual problem, like yeah. between me and that employee. But we know from so much research that an individual performance problem is a systemic problem that impacts the entire team, perhaps the entire organization. Yep. Couldn't agree more.